Okay, here we go again. So, I'm going to try to make these videos relatively short so that uh, they're not too dull. Or um, So, a couple minutes each. I'll do a couple scenes at a time and then we'll, we'll go. In any case, for a little atmosphere, I've added the Scottish sword that I got in my collection. That sword in the background is called a Claymore, which is a Scottish two-handed sword, about five feet long. I've also got my, it's called a penannular brooch or a cloak pin. I made this, and it's going to go on the kilt I'm going to wear at my daughter's wedding. I'm quite pleased I made a bunch of them. So that's what I've been doing in my spare time. Anyhow, so we're going to start with Act 1, Scene 1. Okay, the book summary goes like this. A very short scene opens the play. It is long enough to awaken curiosity, but not to satisfy. We have come in at the end of the witches' meeting. They are just arranging their next appointment before their familiar spirits, devils in animal shapes, call them away into the fog and filthy air. Okay, so in this case, the animal shapes are a cat and a toad. The first witch's cat is called Grey Malkin, and the second witch's toad is called Paddock. And these devils in animal form help them with their magic rituals. The mood of the play is set here, although the action does not start until the next scene. Okay, the purpose of this scene is to let us know certain things about the to set the mood. Uh, the witches like to meet in thunder, lightning, and rain. And it's also to give us a little intro to the witches themselves. Right, so what do we know about witches? First of all, they like they like to meet in uh, deserted places, in the rain and the and the uh, lightning. Um, they can tell the future. We can see here. They say uh, the second, which says when the hurly burly's done, when the battle's lost and won, and that's when they're going to meet with Macbeth. That's their next appointment. And the third, which responds, that will be ere the set of sun. So they know that the battle will be over. You know, sometimes these wars take days and days or weeks or months. They know that this battle is going to be over by the end of the day. And they also know where to plant themselves such that they will meet Macbeth as he exits the battlefield. They also say some interesting things. They say, uh, fair is foul and foul is fair. Right? So good is bad and bad is good. As can be seen by the weather. So for them, bad weather is good and good weather is bad. And good in general is bad and bad in general is good so that's a paradox and a paradox is a seemingly contradictory statement that can be under certain conditions true now i don't know if we have that in our glossary but we want to put that there anyway so fair is foul and foul is fair good is bad and bad is good it seems contradictory but it's true if you're evil which is what the witches appear to be telling us so the scene ends and they are going to float off into the hover through the air um, to find their familiars. And then we begin the second scene. The second scene is where the real action begins. Right, it says, Here we learn about the tough battle, about the rebels who seem to have all the luck, and about two brave men, Macbeth and Banquo, who win the vector victory for Scotland. Duncan rewards Macbeth for his courage by giving him the title Thane of Cawdor. But we ought to remember that the title first belonged to the one who was a most disloyal traitor. All right, so there's a couple of interesting things to note here. That Malcolm and Duncan meet the bloody sergeant who has been in the battle and has been wounded, and he gives them a fair account of what's happened. The battle seemed desperate, like two spent swimmers who cling together and choke their art. Like two dying swimmers who drown each other. Okay, the battle is desperate, and they but... Uh, Macbeth manages to kill MacDonald, who is one of the one of the traitors, when the king of Norway begins a fresh assault. Right? Uh, they seem on the verge of success, but Macbeth and Banquo, being the great warriors that they are, turn the tide. Right? Now this reveals also the first aspect of the tragic hero. So we talked about the tragic hero as a essentially noble and good character, and that noble and good character... Uh, is brought low by a single character defect. So first of all, we have to establish his goodness. So we do that. He does that by his uh, indomitable defense of Scotland, in which he carves his passage through the through the uh, Macdonald traitors through the rebels' troops until he faces uh, Macdonald and guts him like a fish. 
So we establish he's good, he, he's, a, he's a powerful warrior, but also is a righteous warrior fighting in the defense of his country. An interesting side note is on McDonald's side, he has really the King of Norway and Kearns and Gallo glasses. And Kearns and Gallo glasses are mercenary soldiers as from the Western Isles, which I take to mean the Western Isles of Scotland, the Hebrides, or possibly Ireland. And these, these people have, are loyal only to money. They've been paid to fight for McDonald. None of the loyal Scotsmen will fight on his side. But if he does win, he will, he will be the King of Scotland. And so anyway, we find out that, in fact, at the end of the scene, that Macbeth and Banquo have been victorious, and the King of Norway has been cowed into paying uh, for burial of his men. And at the end of the scene, of course, uh, Banquo, Banquo, Macbeth, is given the title of Thane of Cawdor. Now keep in mind, that Macbeth is off fighting, he's not aware of this, of this fact. Okay. So also keep in mind I'm not editing these videos, so if I make a mistake, I'll have to go back and fix it. So, in any case, that is the end of scene two. Scene three. The witch's malice and magic are shown as they await Macbeth on the lonely moor, or heath as they call it, a wasteland area. They have power over the winds and can make life miserable for such men as the captain of the ship The Tiger as we saw, was on his way to Aleppo in Syria, when he'll be waylaid by the witch's wind and power because her wife wouldn't share her chestnuts. The second witch has been killing pigs, which is something that uh, farmers quite often would blame on witches if their pigs died or their milk soured or that sort of thing. It was a, uh, a convenient thing to blame the neighbor uh, who, uh, as being a witch. Their dance, when they hear Macbeth's drum, is made up of steps in groups of three, the magical number. Macbeth and Banquo, however, are ordinary human beings, tired of the day's fighting and grumbling about the weather. Banquo is almost amused by the witches. He cannot bring himself to think of them as women, because your beards forbid me to interpret that you are so. Macbeth is stunned to silence by their prophecies, but Banquo questions them calmly. The audience can judge the witches better than Macbeth can. We know from the previous scene that his courage and not the witch's magic has won in the title of the Thane of Cawdor. We are not surprised, as he is, when Ross calls him by this title. Now keep in mind, of course, that he receives the prophecy from the witches before Ross comes with the news, which makes, to, it, makes it to him prophetic, right? So these witches, which we know to be witches, right, present themselves as the past, present, and future, right? Hail to the Athene of Gloms, the past. Hail to the Athene of Cawdor, the present. I'll hail Macbeth that shall be king hereafter as the future. So they present themselves as the fates, and that's what Macbeth takes them to be. Right? The audience who judge which is better than Macbeth can, as we know from the previous scene, that his courage and not the witch's magic has won in the title of Athene of Cawdor. And we're not surprised, as he is, when Ross calls him by that title. While Ross, Angus, and Banquo speak together, perhaps at the back of the stage, Macbeth speaks his own thoughts aloud in a soliloquy, a speech not intended by the speaker to be overheard. They are frightening thoughts. They frighten Macbeth, as well as us, for murder is in his mind. He tries to reject this first impulse, declaring that he will leave everything to chance. If chance will have me king, why chance may crown me without my stir. Now, in this case, they're on the way to Forest to meet, to meet um, Duncan, and they pass by the witches who present themselves as the fates. They also provide Banquo with a prophecy that his children will be kings, which we can see automatically, or fairly quickly, that would, that would present a problem for Macbeth, who will become king, but all kings want their children to be kings. Now, Banquo here warns Macbeth that this prophecy might be a problem, that the instruments of darkness tell us truths, win us with honest trifles to betray us in deepest consequence. And Macbeth's response, when he says, this super supernatural slicing cannot be ill, cannot be good, if ill, why have, given, why have it given me earnest of success commencing in a truth? Well, you big dummy. <laughs> Banquo has just explained that the instruments of darkness tell us truths to betray us in deepest consequence. 
but uh, Macbeth clearly has uh, ideas in his mind. And it seems to be murder is just as reasonable a, a proposition to him as uh, waiting for a chance to occur. So that's it for the first three scenes. I will discuss uh, the rest of the act in the next video.